Um, we're a little, little short with in-person people today, which is fine. But let's uh, open our notes again to, uh, I don't know what page it is, but I have page 50, 43 um, on communication. So we left off, I think, on definitions of communication. Does that seem familiar? Where is that? Page 42 for uh, your notes. I'm on, mine's page 43, yours is 42. Yes, okay. <clears throat> You guys see that? Yep. <clears throat> Definitions of communication by Wayne Mack. Um, so we left off there uh, last uh, <laughs> last time we met. <clears throat> um, so we're going to cover. My voice just cracked. I'm going finally going through puberty. Um, uh, we're going to cover <clears throat> communication and conflict resolution fairly quickly. Um, I think it's been weeks on this, but we just don't have time. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so if you have questions about certain things, maybe just talk to me afterwards or whatever. Um, and those of you who in, are in Cornerstone, you know, we're going through the conflict resolution study. So this is just, we're going to breeze through that pretty quickly here um, because you guys are already covering that in a lot more <clears throat> detail. And those of you who are watching online who are not going through our study, in our home groups, we'll still cover the main principles um, and you can read more details uh, on your own. <clears throat> um, but some definitions of communication, I don't know if we talked about these last time or not, but um, Wayne Mack just has a few of these that I like. Um, he says uh, first that a, communication is a process of sharing information with another person in such a way that the sender's message is understood in the way that it was intended to be understood. Right. So you're communicating clearly in that sense that it's clear of what you're trying to say and what the meaning is. Secondly, he also says that uh, communication is the art of conveying information and meaning in order to come to a common understanding. And so um, that this would be a lot of what teaching is. Um, good communication and teaching is you're trying to come to a common understanding or help other people come to a common uh, understanding. Uh, so if you see, if you guys see a blur back there, a blurry blob, it's not a ghost, it's a cat. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, um, uh, and he's on the computer. Hey, there we go. All right, cat. That's why my cats stay in the garage. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, thirdly, the process of sharing information with a person in such a way that, uh, the people involved are mutually strengthened, enriched, encouraged, uh, experiencing harmony, unity, and emotional closeness. So there's some couple of definitions there, or we can boil it down to what Stuart Scott says is good communication from God's perspective <clears throat> is sending a message as holy, purposeful, clear, and timely. So I, I like that definition. It's helpful. It's short. It's clear. Um, which is part of the whole purpose of communication is he, exemplifies that in his definition <clears throat> one of the hard things is reading a book on communication and you, it's hard and you don't understand what the author is trying to say so it's like this doesn't make any <laughs> sense what's happening here <clears throat> i've read a few of those before um uh, but again i think i said this last time that in many especially marriage con um conflicts or marriage situations communication is what many experience and many say is the key thing the key issue, the key problem in their, uh, in their marriage. And although it is a key issue, <clears throat> it is not the key issue. It is not the main issue. It is uh, one of many things that need to be <clears throat> uh, dealt with. Now, last week or last time, did we talk about that pyramid diagram? Did we show, did I show that to you guys? Did we yeah. discuss that? Okay, great. So we don't need to do that right now. <clears throat> um, it's on the, the, the back of your syllabus. Uh, but I like to discuss that with people just as it shows communication is one of the skills that needs to be developed, but we first have to look at the heart and <clears throat> our worship before we can get to uh, how to, how to have the principles of more effective uh, communication. Um, 
But then one of the things that I like to do a lot, which is why I put in these notes, is um, let me pull up the passage here, uh, is Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> I like to walk through Ephesians 4, uh, 25 through uh, 32 uh, with, with a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> it gives just a lot of the biblical principles of, uh, of communication. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's more places you could go, excuse me, <clears throat> um, but these are just some very helpful ones. Is that the blind cat? Yeah, yeah. All right, you can tell. It's <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, <clears throat> or we can really see here four principles of communication, in Ephesians 4, uh, 25 through 32. Again, these are things I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll walk through people, uh, I'll walk through with people, excuse me, um, uh, sometimes pretty quickly, depending on maybe how mature they are, or uh, might take a couple sessions to walk through this with people. I'll have them try to memorize the four principles, post them around the room, post them around the house so that they are remembering <clears throat> uh, what these are. But um, again, I didn't develop these. These came from um, uh, Faith Baptist Church in Lafayette, <clears throat> Indiana. Uh, but the first principle is be honest from Ephesians 4.25. This is laying aside, <clears throat> I guess, what, what's going on in verse 22 through 24 in Ephesians 4, actually. Let's, let's look at that first. Whoops. You guys tell me what's going on in, in verse 22 through 24. Putting off and putting on. Yeah, putting off, putting on. <clears throat> He's talking about the old nature versus the new nature, the old man in light of the new man. Um, so, or, or the, the new man in light of the old man, um, you could say. In verse 23, talking about... Um, <clears throat> Uh, being renewed in the spirit of your mind and so on, right? And so why would that be maybe critical to understand first before we get into the so what? The practical applications here. Why should we understand the purpose of the new man putting off and putting on before we understand um, these communication principles? What might be important about that? You have to deal with the heart first and what your motives are. Is that what you're kind of asking? Or yeah, not? you have to deal with the heart. We have to deal with what the motivations are. We have to deal with um, and look at the fact that we are renewed. We're regenerated. We have a new man. We have a new heart. <clears throat> We've been given a, a, a new nature, uh, verse 22 through 24. And so then verse 25, he says the word, what? Therefore. Because of who you are now in Christ, this is how you are to live. And they just happen to be a lot of principles of how do we live in relationship to each other in the new um, relationships in the church. And so verse 25, the first communication principle we see is just be honest. Um, that in our communication, we need to be honest with people. Um, whoops. Uh, we can't uh, fabricate things. Uh, make things up, uh, lie, um, manipulate, uh, speak half-truths or whatever. But we need to be honest. That, that includes speaking. The, the Greek word there for um, speaking the truth in love, that the word speaking there means to speak up, to speak out. To, it means uh, you need to uh, communicate something that uh, is in your going on in your mind and your thoughts, what you're thinking uh, needs to be uh, communicated because we can't read each other's minds. We can't uh, assume what you mean, or you can't assume what I mean, based off of my my body language. A lot of times, you can't necessarily judge that correctly. Um, sometimes you can. Right? You can judge each other's body language. Like, hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. How, how are you? Okay, <laughs> you're not fine. <clears throat> um, or like when Jill said she broke her leg, I, I knew she was fibbing a little bit. Um, just kidding. <clears throat> um, but we need to speak up. We need to be able to 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 speak in a way. <clears throat> that people uh, can understand uh, what we're saying. So this would also include the idea of um, we, we can't clam up or be silent 
And uh, oftentimes in, in a relationship, you have somebody who's maybe more boisterous, more loud. Uh, they communicate um, more uh, verbally. And you have others who, when they're in a conflict, they clam up, they, they shut down, they don't talk. Uh, biblically speaking, that's not really allowed. That's not really an acceptable thing. Um, is it preferred to major outburst? Probably, but it's still not ideal. It's still not something to be uh, resolved to do. Um, so they, there needs to be verbal um, communication given. <clears throat> um, we also need to understand that when we're speaking, being honest, we need to speak the truth. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, the word says, lay aside falsehood. <clears throat> speaking truth each one of you with his neighbor uh, again so things like outright dishonesty lying fabrications denying the truth those sort of things obviously that's wrong <clears throat> um, again inconsistencies in your speech versus like your body language or the what in counseling terms is halo data uh, like the halo you know around your head this is <clears throat> kind of like more of the outside of kind of who you are um, <clears throat> or um, you have more disguised communication with certain innuendos or applied accusations, but said in a subtle way that is, is meant to kind of throw somebody off um, or to make you seem better than you really are, but it meant to put somebody down in subtle, in subtle ways. Um, one of my children is really good at this and it's, it's unfortunate. Um, we try to call this child out sometimes on this or a lot of times on this. Um, but that's, uh, that's unacceptable as well. Um, uh, I, again, I think good communication based on Colossians 3.9, we see is, um, is, is doesn't come naturally. Um, it's more of an, you could say an art form um, in that uh, it, it takes effort. It takes, it takes energy. It takes time. Um, and because Paul says in uh, Colossians 3, 9, you know, do not lie to one another since you, uh, since you put off the old man with its evil practices. And that put on, verse 10, put on the new man who is being renewed in the full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Um, and so, again, it's the same sort of idea um, that uh, <clears throat> we're putting off and putting on. So this is a, it's a process that we need to be practicing and getting good at um we need to um do what it takes to improve our communication much like if we want to improve a certain sport or something else another art form we want to take lessons or get practice at it or try hard at it or whatever we need to do that even with our communication um uh, Again, thirdly, with being honest, we also want to speak the truth lovingly, not just speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15. Ephesians 4.15. <clears throat> um, you know, we, we, we want to uh, not just speak the truth and say, well, it's the truth, and I'm sorry you were offended by it. Uh, if we're just quoting scripture, sure. Um, but... Uh, <clears throat> let somebody be offended by the gospel and not by us. Um, let somebody be offended by the truth of the word of God, not because of how you said it. Um, we want to be concerned about <clears throat> what we say, kind of how we say it, how much we say. Um, uh, we want to say things and speak the truth to people with their best interest in mind and not just um, trying to get my point across or get my, my uh <clears throat> my ideas across whatever but with the other person's best interest in mind and with that we also want to be make sure we're a skilled listener that if we are going to um learn how to communicate well and speak the truth in love we need to listen well why might that be important huh? why might it be in it? why <laughs> oh well that's good man so yeah <laughs> well, why is that important so you oh, can figure well, out that Jill is JJ's daughter. That's skilled listening. Yes, you're right. a skilled <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, Will, why do we have to... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I can't remember what the question was now. <laughs> why, 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 is, why is listening an important skill <clears throat> in 
in, in our conversations, our communication with other people, and especially in speaking truth to them. So you can hear what they're saying. I think listening is showing compassion. Okay, showing compassion. Yeah, they understand what they're saying. Um, yeah. <clears throat> to know, yeah, I mean, to how to apply the, the word to whatever they're saying or going through. Mm -hmm. hear, hear what they're saying so that you can respond to what the word says. Yeah, hear what they're saying, understand, yeah, with what the, <clears throat> what, understand with a more appropriate scripture than maybe kind of what we thought or something. Man. We, want, we want to be able to, to listen really well so we can know kind of where they're coming from and different things. Yeah, uh, Mary. Isn't it, a skilled listener also, you, you also hear what they're not saying. You know, what they, what they may not be saying, what they may be skipping over, what they may be avoiding, what they may not be saying. Sure, in what sense? Well, especially in a counseling sense, if you're, if you're discussing, um, whatever you're discussing, you can, you can kind of, see where they're leading the conversation and where where they may want to avoid parts that you're that you're trying to talk about yeah good so yeah they may leave out certain important aspects or um, um, details of, of, of a situation and we want to listen to that <clears throat> to know how where to press in sometimes we're pressing a little more sometimes um, and sometimes we're going to pull back and then not press as hard so Okay, good. So that's principle number one. Principle number two, or rule number two, is keeping current. So that's Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Um, you can be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> keeping current. So this says be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Um, yeah, this cat's where we were fighting. Um, the idea of being angry and yet not sinning <clears throat> it can be very confusing. It's, it's brought a lot of confusion, I think, in counseling and in the church um, <clears throat> because people will make it an excuse of, well, I'm righteously angry because you offended me. Or <clears throat> I'm angry, but I'm not um, like sinful angry right now. Um, <clears throat> and that might be the case, but the, the idea of being angry and not sinning <clears throat> there's again there's a whole book you can read about this called good and angry by david pallison um so you can read that <clears throat> but anger is an emotion right anger is an emotional response to something when people say i have an anger problem like i don't like that because anger is not a thing anger is an emotional response to a perceived wrong or perceived evil and so god gets angry christ got angry um there, there are appropriate times to get angry um, at sin, at, at injustice. Um, um, more to do with God's injustice, God's kingdom, rather than what we see in our world today. Um, it's uh, a, a, an understanding of what is wrong with, with um, people disobeying God and going against his word. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of the idea of righteous anger, which we'll get to more righteous anger in, in a whole different class. Um, but the majority of times we get angry, it's simple as humans. We just do. Because you hurt me, I'm offended, I'm sinning, I'm angry. Right? Um, but what he's talking about here it isn't so much allowances for sin, or it's not that at all. It's more of uh, using the energy, uh, the emotional energy, uh, the spiritual energy, your physical energy, that you would on, on your anger, because anger drains you of energy and strength. It just does. Um, using that, um, rather than sinfully, using that uh, for good, using that to resolve issues, using that uh, to, uh, to, to do good to somebody, using that for appropriate action, I think is the idea here. And he says, do not let the sun go down in your anger. Okay, well, in the context of a, of a, of a relationship, <clears throat> so we have a conflict, rather than me getting angry about it, well, you offended me. Well, I'm going to use that energy and, and that, that, that 
my right mind and strength to go and talk to you about try to get things resolved to um you know we we want to not let the sun go down our anger meaning deal with today's problems as they come admit my guilt of sin maybe confront sin if needed um uh, we need to deal with our, with each day's issues rather than hold on to them and become bitter and frustrated and and all that uh, all that energy that we would use and in, in being and uh, and uh, deal with the problem is now pent up inside of us and so now we're just frustrated we're going to explode or we're going to just become more and more angry because a failure to to resolve maybe each day's problems means you're probably guilty of sin because you're not dealing with it, you're not confronting, you're not confessing sin. It's going to allow bitterness to set in, distorting problems in, in a marriage relationship. It's going to endanger physical intimacy. And so we want to bring up questions to to people, especially our spouses. Again, this is marriage and family, so that's kind of the context here. Um, but questions to ask ourselves before we bring up an issue. Again, this is related to all sorts of uh, communication, not just with spouses, for those of you not yet married, but um, we want to ask ourselves first though, do we have the right information? Do we have all the data correct? Do I know what's going on here? I ask the right questions. Why am I bringing up the issue? Is it because I'm just hurt and I'm offended? I have giant toes? Uh, or am I bringing up an issue because they are sinning against God and my concern is for God and his kingdom? Have I repented of my own sins? You know, getting locked out of my own eye, Matthew 7. Um, are my words that I'm going to be using loving to them? Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Is my timing right? Uh, is it midnight? Is it first thing in the morning? Is it when the kids are doing homeschool and my wife's super busy and I sit down and say, hey, hey, honey, something's wrong. That's not a good idea. Or in the middle of church or whatever. Is my timing correct? Is my timing good? Is my timing <clears throat> appropriate? And then have I prayed? Have I asked for God's help in dealing with this? If I haven't done those things, I probably shouldn't go and deal with the issue. I should probably wait until I've done those things make sure my heart is correct and my heart is right. Um, what we need to resolve, especially in a marriage, um, to deal with the problems as quick as we can and not go to bed angry. We just need to resolve to do that. Paul Tripp said that when him and his wife were first married, they resolved never go to bed angry. So sometimes it meant they were both laying awake in bed, proper their eyelids open until the other person spoke. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I can semi relate to that. Thankfully, I watched Paul Tripp's videos and read his books before he got married, so I knew not to do that. But it doesn't mean I'm still stubborn and simple. <clears throat> um, but we need to resolve to deal with quick deal, to deal with issues as quick as we can. Uh, again, in Romans twelve, as far as it depends on you. Third principle, then, as we move on, uh, third principle is attacking the problem, not the person. Attacking the problem, not the person. So verse 29 through 30, uh, we're skipping verse 28 because it's talking about stealing. Um, so verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up or good for edification, that uh, building up the, the legacy standard ber- version, uh, the LS. V uh, says, uh, good for building up what is needed so that it will give grace to those who hear. Um, <clears throat> good for building up. No unwholesome word, but words that are going to be full of grace to build up. And when you're, when you're trying to attack a person, your words are tearing down. Your words are demolishing. Your words are demeaning. Your words are attacking. But when you're trying to confront biblically and lovingly, your words are still edifying. We have a problem in our culture today where the word con- conf- uh, to confront or confrontation is seen as like super sit- sinful, super bad. Like we don't do that uh, because that just brings negativity. But the idea of confronting 
even in certain Greek words, implies grace and implies compassion and, and kindness, even in uh, the word itself. <clears throat> and in this, in this context, we need to not use words that are going to be harsh and demeaning, but words that are going to be building up. Uh, the word unwholesome uh, there, it, it has the idea, uh, or it, it was used of um, rotting fish, so a fish market that fish is unwholesome because it smells this is rotten it's bad you, it's useless it's worthless throw it out that's the idea and so when we're speaking unkind harsh words that's basically what we're doing is we're acting as though uh we are just we're being useless we're being uh, words just need to be tossed and thrown out they're 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 uh, demeaning words it zeroes in on the person's character when we're doing that rather when you speak words even when we're confronting that are edifying, even when we're not, especially when we're not confronting, just edifying. <clears throat> Words are build, that are building up. They're focusing on the problem, focusing on uh, finding a solution. Uh, they're full of grace. Uh, they deal with the person, uh, with, with maybe what the person is saying or what the person is doing rather than their character. Um, it, it's, it's having your spouses or partners or your friends' mo- uh, welfare first and foremost in your mind. <clears throat> rather than saying, hey, don't you are you're always this or you're never you never do this. Or how come whenever I do this, you always do this or right? it's always in a negative way. But turning that around to find ways to encourage them. Finding ways to build them up. <clears throat> finding ways to encourage them and spur them on, um, especially when they're already maybe down in the dumps or discouraged or struggling. Why are we struggling? Uh, that's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, but to come alongside them and to say, speak words of grace to them so that it, it builds them up, <clears throat> so that it gives grace to them. That part of our job as believers is giving grace to people through Christ as we are speaking words of edification to them. In uh, Hebrews four, it says that we can go before the throne of the throne, go before the throne of grace to find mercy or find grace and help in time of need. Part of that comes from each other. Part of that comes from living in the, the body of Christ and the community with each other. As we give grace to those through our speech, and oftentimes that's just going to be maybe quoting scripture or or helping them to apply scripture or something like that. <clears throat> and then fourth and last is acting, not reacting. Pardon my bad hair day here. Um, acting, not reacting, Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. <clears throat> Let all bitterness, anger, wrath, um, shouting or clamor, slander be put away from you along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, graciously forgiving each other. I like that. This is, I have never read this, this version yet in, the, in Ephesians 4. Huh. Graciously forgiving each other. Just as God of Christ has also graciously forgiven you. That's new. I've never read that before. I really like the, the Legacy Standard Bible so far. <laughs> no, uh, just uh, the free version on uh, online. Oh. Yeah, I don't have. I, we were gonna get it. We were supposed to get yeah, it at Shepherds. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Man, so bummed. They good. Yeah, they I know. Good. So many people showed up. Paul Washer was there. This guy Owen Strahan from Midwestern. They all these guys still flew in the Shepherds Conference. Just they were, pro- yeah, I know. Eric, I, I think Eric was kind of bummed. We didn't, we didn't just like, whatever, we're going to go for a day. And just, <laughs> whatever. Um, but we didn't know. I mean, no, no one knew, uh, you know, but people just still showed up and they all got free Bibles. Mm-hmm. But whatever. Austin Duncan said there's no good snacks. So, <laughs> um, anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, is, uh, again, acting, not reacting here. That's the last, um, Point. So again, as part of the, the application of putting off and putting on is we don't respond this way, um, but we're, we are to respond this way. So again, reactions to the problems are going to be with verse 31, bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander, malice. <clears throat> the word bitterness means a perpetual animosity. Uh, that that le- that leads to harsh and loving opinions about other people. 
wrath, again, passionate rage, anger, again, a subtle, deep flowing sort of anger, a slow burn, like, a, like in coals, you have those coals that you um, often you kind of want to cook with. Uh, you, they're the slowly just burning coals. That's anger. It's not out. It's not necessarily outbursts. It's slow burning. And eventually when you put more logs in that thing, what happens when you put like a big old log on a slow burning coal fire? It catches, on fire. catches on fire real quick. It's just a hot fire. It just, it just goes up in flames. Super cool to watch and play around with fire, but that's what it's going on here. Um, clamoring or, or, or shouting. It just means shouting. Slander and speaking evil of somebody that comes from um, the settled uh, indignation or hatred towards them. Um, <clears throat> um, slander doesn't necessarily have to be something that's even untrue, but it's for the purpose of tearing them down. Um, the gossip is speaking things that are untrue. Uh, malice, a general wishing of ill towards those who are around you. Uh, some will say that's the root of all the other problem so those are the responses that we're not to have I and mean, those are inner man problems that manifest themselves outwardly but instead we are to act by being kind the word there um uh, being kind to one another <clears throat> that word kindness there means like a benevolence a goodness a usefulness that in your actions in your speech and your attitude you're being kind, you're being benevolent, you're being useful to them. Tenderhearted, that's again, a heart of compassion. You're, you're weeping with those who weep, you're rejoicing with those who rejoice. You're sympathetic. You see someone's hurting and crying or just sad. You just shut your mouth and sit down and what's going on? Or just don't say anything. Be like Job's friends for the first seven days and just sit there and don't say anything. There's a compassion there. And then forgiving, graciously forgiving. <clears throat> to forgive, it, it, it's, the idea is a releasing of a debt. I'm releasing a debt that I owe to you because I sinned against you. Uh, or no, sorry, you owe to me, sorry. If I'm forgiving you, so I'm, I'm getting everything confused here. If I'm forgiving you, it's because I'm releasing debt you owe me because you sinned against me. I'm forgiving you. I'm, I'm releasing that. I'm canceling that debt. Paid in full. Done. That's the idea. I'm releasing the offense. <clears throat> it's, it's an exercise in grace of releasing the offense that is done against you. Uh, the word forgiveness, it's a legal term, a legal transaction. Just as God in Christ has graciously forgiven you, <clears throat> God, how did, how did Christ forgive us? Oh. You know, well, he died for us, yeah. <clears throat> he absorbed the debt. He, he forgives us. He doesn't bring it back up and say, well, yeah, I remember when he did this. And he wipes it clean. He, he, <clears throat> he doesn't make excuses <clears throat> for, um, uh, for, I guess, you know, God never sins or has outbursts, but it's never brought back up to throw in your face. None of that. None of that. <clears throat> we ask God to forgive us and he forgives us without qualification. When people ask us for forgiveness, we forgive them without qualification. I'll forgive you. If I like what you have to say, or if you can do enough good deeds, or when I, I'll forgive you when I'm ready. No. <clears throat> the parable of Matthew 18, no time to go there, but that's a very telling thing. If you don't forgive, you, that means you are, like, if you're perpetually not forgiving, I understand there can be struggles, and I, I want to be sympathetic to that, especially in adultery abuse situations, but if, if there's a perpetual unforgiveness and a hardness of heart there, scripture just says you're an unbeliever. Matthew 18. <clears throat> we, the, the, the extent to which we forgive others is the extent to which we understand God's forgiveness to us. Or I could say maybe not 
definitively you're an unbeliever, but you have no assurance that you're saved if you are perpetually unforgiving and there's bitterness in your heart. That'll get somebody canceled today. <laughs> Thanks for no one ever watches his videos. <clears throat> Cornerstone Church. We have we've said so many things that I'm so surprised there's no articles written about us like in the town. We have articles written about us online, blog posts and, and videos people make about us, about, about me and about Eric. Um, and it's just, it's comical. It's funny. Um, and uh, I'm not going to tell you. I, you don't need to know. You don't need to know. <clears throat> um, I, but I, I, but this one guy who, uh, who attacked us, multiple times uh, he also attacked MacArthur, Jerry Rag, Steve Lawson, Rick Holland, uh, all these other guys that we really like and we're partners with the ministry. I'm like, oh great, cool. Well we're we're in line with those guys. We're in good company, whatever. I, I get criticisms like that. I don't even read it. It doesn't bother me. I don't What's care. the attacks about? <clears throat> Our theology, the fact that I'm paid, um, the fact that we meet inside of a building that we rent, uh, that women uh, wear pants. Yeah, that's, that's yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, many other things. <laughs> um, on my Facebook post, I liked, you know, like when I first created Facebook, like I was late in the game. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was like, oh, I like, I like the crates was back in the day. And I like Harry Potter, you know, whatever. And so people like this guy went back in my search history and Something saw all like that Harry stuff. Potter. Yeah. And yeah. so now I'm like, uh, you know, I'm a horrible elder and I get, I get paid. So that's, that's sinful apparently. Anyway, <clears throat> and we, we teach the doctrines of grace that God sovereignly ordains and saves people. So that's, that's heresy to him <clears throat> and a few other people. But anyway, not a few other people obviously believe that, but <clears throat> the attacks have come against us. So this is funny. Anyway, <clears throat> um, but we where how do we even get there? I don't know. Forgiveness. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So <clears throat> only through the spirit of God uh, can we can we resolve kind of issues and, and, and communicate in a way that's effective and is biblical and is honoring to the Lord. OK. Um, <clears throat> geez. Let's get into the conflict resolution <clears throat> again we're gonna go through this sort of quickly <clears throat> um, i apologize for that but we need to get on to physical intimacy and get into a little bit of the the kid um par the parenting issues <clears throat> tonight we'll finish up our class next week um as well um but conflicts i mean this is if there's one underrated issue probably in the church that needs to be every church needs to understand more fully it's probably biblical conflict resolution <clears throat> this will help with so many other issues um <clears throat> so many other issues um how would we define conflict if you look there on the uh, towards the bottom of your notes this is what's conflict a definition um <clears throat> If you look at the point two there, talking about how conflict is a military term, there's James 4.1, James <clears throat> uses the word um, for, he says, what is the cause of the conflicts and quarrels among you? He used, he's using two different words, meaning like the battles and the wars. The battles and the wars. What's the, what's the source of the battles and the wars among you? <clears throat> um, see what the Legacy Standard Bible says. Uh, yeah, what's the source of, of quarrels and conflicts? Is it not the source, uh, your pleasures at wage war and your members? Um, similar to the New American Standard. <clears throat> um, again, the quarrels and, and, and conflicts, the quarrels and the fights are, are battle terms. Two people or more, two or more people in opposition to one another. And so conflict could be defined as this, that Conflict, uh, a conflict is when both parties sin against one another in their communication and their actions and are then in opposition uh, to one another. That's one good definition. However, um, I kind of like this other one a little, a little better, that conflict is a difference of opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. The reason I like that one better 
it's probably a little more it's probably a little more clear which i don't know why i have the other one in there i should just keep this one um is because not every conflict is has to be defined as sinful every conflict is sinful um it typically turns into sin um but we can have like the elders we have conflict sometimes in the sense of like we're not going to maybe fully come to an agreement on what we want to do or how we want something to work out but we're not sinning against each other there's no animosity there's no there's no like conflict where we're butting heads sinfully against each other i'm sure sometimes but but that's thankfully that's rare um um so there's a difference of opinion or purpose that maybe frustrates someone else's goals or desires and so it's more than just maybe a disagreement, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to lead into sin um, where, where we're sinning against each other. It could probably lead its sin just in my own heart oftentimes. So I just need to deal with that internally. Um, but oftentimes when that's not dealt internally, that's where you have the conflicts and the butting of heads between two people, right? And we need to see conflict as an opportunity to glorify God. That we need to see conflict as an opportunity from God for our good. That we need to see that every conflict we have is, is purposed and planned by God for us to learn something and to grow. Not to avoid relationships, but to grow in those relationships. <clears throat> every conflict that we're in is sovereignly ordained by God for us for that moment. We need to understand that. <clears throat> um, where do conflicts come from? You kind of think of it this way, I'm just kind of skimming this. <clears throat> Again, you look at the, the relationship pyramid um, uh, on the, uh, the, in our appendix there at the end of the notes. Think of it like an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is what you typically see in a relationship or in a conflict. <clears throat> but underneath the ice is 90% of that, uh, of that iceberg. And so that is where the heart is, is active and is working and is functioning. <clears throat> that is then going to be exposed um, at the tip there when we are um, in a in a conflict. <clears throat> um, this next section here talks about the relationship dynamic uh, relationship dynamic pyramid um, <clears throat> in a in a pretty uh, in a more um, uh, detailed way, but we'll skip that because we've already done that. Um, if you look at, uh, <clears throat> again, talking about the heart, um, letter D, again, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom issue with conflicts, it has to come from our heart. We have to see that everything we say, everything we do, everything we think, everything we want, everything we desire, all of our emotions, all of our affections, all of our thoughts, all of our will, comes from <clears throat> our heart comes from our hearts comes from what we are worshiping what we are desiring <clears throat> i was listening to a podcast today on emotions it was very helpful um he just said you know in scripture we, we see a lot of places taking your thoughts captive having your mind renewed your thoughts renewed he's like we don't ever see that about emotions it's like we don't ever see that about emotions is it because your emotions are directly related to your thinking? I was like, duh. What podcast is it? The ACBC podcast. Uh, today it was, uh, they come out every Monday. Um, it was really good. It was uh, by Nicholas Ellen. Um, he's a pastor down in Dallas. Or I don't know where he is. Somewhere down Texas. <clears throat> Some big city down Texas. But he's really good because he was just saying, look, you know, we need to understand that our emotions, sometimes we don't need to figure out how am I emotionally broken? It's like, your emotions are broken. You need to, you need to take your thoughts captive and how you're thinking through the situations of life that have been affected you and how your emotions are now responding to that. Um, and basically looking at the, my emotional responses are an, are an issue of my heart or an issue of my thinking or an issue of my worship. And anger is an emotional response. That comes from my worship, comes from my idolatry. <clears throat> if I'm worshiping something that I might get in, I'm going to sin to get it. But if I'm worshiping Christ, I'm worshiping God, then my conflicts will be resolved much more quickly. 
Um, we have to remember the gospel with our conflicts, so on. Uh, look at uh, a couple of pages over the typical responses to conflict. I know we're moving really quick, guys. But appreciate your your grace. What page? Where are we now? I've kind of lost. I don't know. Fifty-two. <laughs> Fifty-two. Okay. Fifty-two. Um, typical typical responses to uh, to how to avoid and resolve conflict. <clears throat> Typical responses. So this is seen as a slippery slope. Can Sandy develop this? <clears throat> um, you have your escape responses, where I, I want to avoid or try to resolve a conflict this way by denying that it's there. <clears throat> if I never admit that it's there, uh, that's just going to promote bitterness in my heart. <clears throat> or I'm going to flee it. I'm going to fly away from it, run away from it. Or suicide, the ultimate escape from a conflict is to kill yourself. <clears throat> On the other side of the, uh, of the slope, you have the attack responses. So assault using, using physical force or verbal attack, yelling, screaming, manipulation, <clears throat> or litigation, taking somebody before a civil judge to get your way. Oh, you don't like that? I'll sue you. Come on. <clears throat> um, I can't remember where there was a stat that uh, ACBC put out about uh, litigation in America. And it's something really like it was some astronomical number of how many cases are opened every year. It's, I, I, it was like 100 million cases or something like that. Remember, yeah, it was so many. Like, wait, are you kidding me? It was some big number, right? Yeah. It, was, it was like 100 million cases every year are, are like, um, <clears throat> um, got, like go through the courts. Obviously not all of them go to court, but uh, they go through the paperwork process and all that. <clears throat> it's just, it's so many. We're a lit very litigious society. And then <clears throat> a, the ultimate attack response is murder. You're killing them because you hate them so much. But in the middle, you have the biblical uh, pattern for conflict resolution. In the middle of that, of that slope, you have the biblical ways to resolve it. <clears throat> Again, Ken Sandy in his, in his book, uh, Peacemaker, goes through these really um, succinctly, really, uh, really well, <clears throat> uh, but yet also very succinct. Um, he talks about how we need to glorify God um, in our conflicts. That in order for us to resolve conflict, we need to first see how do we need to glorify God? How do we need to think through this biblically? How do we need to see God's hand in this? How do we need to see God's sovereignty in the midst of this conflict? <clears throat> how do we need to see that? Um, how do we need to trust the Lord in this conflict? How do we need to see God's kingdom and God's will in this conflict rather than my own? Uh, we need to view conflict as an opportunity from God to learn to serve other people, learn to grow to be like Christ, and then learn to glorify him. Every conflict, and you need to teach yourself this and teach people this, every conflict is an opportunity to learn how to grow to be more like Christ, how to learn to serve other people better, and how to learn to glorify God better. <clears throat> if I'm in a conflict with somebody, I, that it's an opportunity for me to learn how do I need to love them more? How do I need to serve them more? How do I need to show them honor more? And that's the idea. Uh, secondly, getting the log out of your own eye. <clears throat> um, before I go and confront somebody else, I need to look at how am I sinning? What's, what logs do I have? Where do I need to see uh, my heart in this? Uh, how have I sin where do i need to ask forgiveness and these sort of things this is critical if you don't do this in a conflict situation then there will never be resolution until like in a, in a mediation cases I, I will never have two parties come together and meet unless they are both willing and able to see where they have sinned in a, in a, in a situation <clears throat> if they don't know how to do that then there will never be reconciliation with uh, the other person third uh, we need to gently restore galatians 6 1 so this is confronting uh, we maybe need, can overlook at times maybe we need to confront somebody and seek to restore the relationship <clears throat> um, by loving gentle correction um, towards them 
to see, to show them their need for change, to confess my sin, but then to point out uh, where they have sinned as well if, if they don't see that. But oftentimes in conflict resolution, if I admit, say, here, man, here's how I've sinned against you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Most of the time, the other person will, yeah, you know, you're right. You know, I forgive you. And I, I, I sinned too, man. I, I'm sorry. I sinned here. This is how I sinned. Please forgive me for that. That's most of the time that what happens, with, especially among believers. That's most of the time. <clears throat> but when it doesn't, you, just, you need to go and confront. And then fourth, you go and be reconciled. So this is, okay, you have the restoration of a hey, ask for forgiveness and, um, uh, or we, I'm sorry, we've, we've confronted, we've asked for forgiveness and we're confronted and now we are um, <clears throat> granting and asking of forgiveness here uh, with go and be, be reconciled. Uh, that we are dealing with matters involved, we're dealing with personal matter, matters, material possessions, um, other things. We're, we're making sure the relationship is, is uh, that all issues in relationship are brought to the table. We're resolving things. We're bringing things up, maybe from past hurts or whatever that need to be corrected, need to be dealt with, <clears throat> um, need, things that need to be forgiven. Um, again, there's much more there we could talk about, but you have to read Keen Sandy's book for more just because we don't have time uh, to go through that. Partly because we go through a lot of this really in, in a 12-week study in our home groups. So. Um, in Romans 14, 19, um, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding or mutual edification so that it builds people up. And we, again, with conflict resolution, we as well, we don't want to give up too easily. We want to have the idea of, of Romans uh, 12, 21 of do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace or live peaceably with everyone. Uh, we need to make sure we are trying our hardest and our best to pursue peace, to exhaust all of our resources, to be reconciled to one another. And sometimes that might mean I am trying to pursue somebody for resolution and they are refusing and there's nothing else I can do. It happened to me this past year and somebody else kind of came in and helped shepherd the situation. And, and then I was finally able to get together that person and, and be resolved. And it was, it was a joy. Um, but sometimes you have, you hit a wall and you have to have somebody else come in and help. Right. But that's why we have the church and that's why we have one another. I'm um, in Matthew five, nine says, blessed are the peacemakers for those They shall be called sons of God. You know, what this means is that those who seek peace, those who seek biblical conflict resolution, uh, they will be recognized as believers, as the sons of God by how they deal with life in a very distinct and critical way. The gospel of Christ is at stake and what we need to live is those who have been fact affected by it and how we resolve our conflicts. All right. Cool. Hey, let's take a little bit of a break. Come back, talk about um, biblical sexuality, and then we'll uh, see how far we get in talking about um, the goals of parenting. Let's take a little bit of a break. Just kidding. All right, guys. Uh, so we're back for the recording. Uh, we're just talking about Abner Chow and the Legacy Standard Bible. Check it out legacystandardbible.org or legacy standard or ls ls bible.org uh, the website open right now so i'm reading it um at least that's the online version i don't know where to go to buy it buy it i think steadfast bibles steadfast bibles if you could google, google them um that's where you can purchase it um like a hard a hard copy <laughs> grace books has it yeah actually we look i looked a few days ago and they were sold out um and uh steadfast bibles might be sold out too i don't i don't know <clears throat> um <clears throat> i'm kind of waiting for the whole thing to be printed before i buy a new bible but we'll see <clears throat> um 
So we're on a new section of notes on just biblical sexuality. You know, I took these notes from Dr. Street, adapted them, edited them a little bit. Um, but uh, again, so the disclaimer is if it's, you don't like something, it's his, it's his fault. Um, <clears throat> the issue of sexual intimacy uh, in many churches today is you either have this weird old school Victorian approach where we just don't talk about it, sins, nasty, dirty, we don't want to discuss it and whatever. We don't, we don't talk about it. We'll bring it up in church. We don't talk about it to the youth. We don't talk about it to our own kids. We don't discuss it. Or more so today, we have the postmodern sort of post postmodern, I guess you would say, liberation view of sex. And it's the highest form of human relationships. And what it's what makes a marriage or a any relationship good. Um, so you have those, so those two extremes oftentimes, um, and, but, and you also have people in the church who see these extremes and want to help people and want to deal with issues that the world is talking about. And, but sometimes they go too far. Um, <clears throat> many times their reasoning would be, well, the world is asking these sort of questions that our grandparents didn't ask, so we need to answer them. But um, <clears throat> sometimes we just don't need to discuss things that are shameful and sinful. Uh, Ephesians 5, 11 through uh, 13 says that we should rather expose the fact that these things are sin, uh, but not talk about them uh, because they're shameful. Um, certain things need to be shamed <laughs> rather than promoted and not necessarily uh, talked about uh, super uh, in, in much detail, uh, especially when it comes to um, sexual intimacy. Um, we do need to have frank discussions, open discussions with people about these things, but also discretion is appropriate and needed as well. Um, uh, and many times those conversations just need to be need to happen in private rather than from a public forum, uh, like a sermon or whatever. Um, um, uh, just thinking through and viewing intimacy and marriage, we need to view it in the context of marriage as holy as like praying and reading the Bible together and as preaching and giving at Sunday school. These sort of things in the sense of it's, it's, it's holy, it's honorable, it's a blessing from the Lord. Right. Um, that we need to not just think of intimacy in the sense of just physical things, but it's, there's the mind, the, the emotional aspect of it as well. Um, it's not just being in good shape will ha make you have a better sex life. That's not necessarily the case. It starts with the mind. It starts with the heart. It starts with your uh, your biblical thinking as opposed to all physical. <clears throat> so I think a biblical view of intimacy is that sex in a marriage between one man and one woman is pure and holy. Genesis 1, 27, Genesis 1, 31 talks about that, how the man or, and woman are becoming one, one flesh. God calls that good. Um, God calls that uh, something that is very good. Um, Hebrews, as Dr. Sri likes to say, Hebrews 13, 4, in the sense of the marriage bed is to be uh, made pure and holy. Um, he, he likes to say that it's, it's a form of worship between a husband and a wife. Um, and I, I would agree with that. I think it's a helpful way to think, think about that. <clears throat> and we'll see that here in a minute. Because <clears throat> it's not so much sexual intimacy is not the basis of a marriage because some marriages might not even be able to to be intimate because of physical issues um, deformities and so on uh, because marriage is first and foremost not a physical union there's a spiritual aspect behind it it's not just being physical together right um, it's a very important aspect of marriage um, to not participate 
with in sexual intimacy with your spouse can be seen as sin against God in particular cases, which we'll talk about. But it doesn't equal marriage. John 4, the woman at the well, um, Jesus says, look, go call your husband. What does she say? I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you said rightly. All right? You've had four husbands, and the man you're with now isn't your husband. The dude you're sleeping with now isn't your husband. Like, just because you're intimate doesn't mean you're married. Right? <clears throat> it doesn't make what, a, a good marriage or a bad marriage. Um, unity in marriage goes way beyond the physical intimacy aspect, and a, a successful marriage goes way beyond um, intimacy, right? Intimacy, we could say, is a culmination of a good marriage, but not necessarily the basis of one. Um, sexual intimacy has, has the primary goal of satisfying the spouse, um, not yourself it's a much like love it's a self-sacrificing for the benefit of the other person um however with this god has also designed it so that as you're doing so you're also benefited um and uh and uh and it can have much enjoyment first corinthians 7 3 let's turn there actually We talk about these things too, just in our culture, it's just, it's just seen as, uh, we just don't know how to think through this as a culture. We, we think sex is the highest form of, of everything in life. So we fight for it um, in very sinful ways. And it's become such a norm um, that even many pastors don't have a problem with spouses viewing pornography together or they don't have a problem with um, them doing it themselves um, which is what there's just such a such a big problem with pornography in the church which that's a we'll get to that later um, but first Corinthians 7 3 says the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife likewise also the wife to her husband verse 4 the wife doesn't have authority over her own body but the husband does the husband does not that's a wife uh, and likewise, also the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So it's the idea of <clears throat> giving of yourself, of your body for the benefit, the pleasure of your spouse. Uh, many times a couple gets married. Well, why do you want to get married? Well, they make me feel good. Well, what happens when they don't make you feel good? Same with this. Well, why do you want to have sex? Well, because I really want to feel good. It may feel good for a little bit, but it's, it's, you're, you're going to go downhill and guaranteed <clears throat> couples who don't know how to think through intimacy biblically and, 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 and are selfish are going to have problems with, uh, with this. And they're going to come seek counseling guaranteed. Also, couples who don't know how to resolve conflict and communicate very well are going to have problems with physical intimacy, and they're going to come to you with problems. When it's self-seeking of, well, you know, my wife doesn't want to ha have sex with me. She only wants to do it once a month. Well, what are you doing to help her with that? How are you serving her? How are you loving her? How are you benefiting her? <clears throat> So it's, for the, it's the issue of you are trying to fulfill their pleasure, their, their excitement. <clears throat> Proverbs 5 says that um, the, the husband is to be satisfied with the wife of his youth and that her breasts are to satisfy him at all times. That she, she can take, she can initiate the intimacy there. It's not just the guy initiating, as we often hear about in our culture um but there's supposed to be a giving of yourself for the benefit of the other person um again, guy created both husbands and wife with equal ability to satisfy each other first corinthians 7 4 which we just discussed i guess i got ahead of myself there um again for the purpose of uh, of of fulfilling them and, and, and causing them joy which is why we don't need outside things or outside resources outside of the marriage bed 
to be fulfilled, such as pornography or these sex toys or I don't know all this goofy stuff that thankfully I don't know anything about, but I know there's stuff out there. It's just, it's just inappropriate. You drive through Las Vegas, you know, that there's things going on. Uh, or you drive through uh, Evanston, you see these billboard signs for these like weird shops in Evanston, Wyoming. I'm like, what the heck? Where are we? Um, anyway, um, because the husband and the wife are able to satisfy each other, we don't need outside resources. If we want to, if you're looking for outside resources, it's because there's sin in the marriage or sin in that. And that needs to be repented of. So there can actually be enjoyment and actually be pleasure and actually be enjoyed. And with that pleasure in physical intimacy and sex is not forbidden or sinful as many of the uh, people like say, oh, Puritans, Puritans were hated sex. No, they didn't. They, they understood it. And they, there's, there's cases of, of them disciplining women out of the church for, not, for denying their husbands um, or denying um, men or, or uh, husbands denying their wives intimacy. And so they're disciplining men out of the church for this. Puritans recorded this. So Puritans weren't against this. It was some, you know, dirt, certain colonial Victorian types um, that thought this was purely for procreation. Catholics kind of have that view. Um, this is purely for, for procreation and not for pleasure. Uh, that's wrong. That's sinful. Um, it, it's God made it for enjoyment, for the ecstasy, for the, um, it, because marriage is a picture of Christ in the church, right? Every aspect of marriage is a, is a, is a picture of that and I'm looking forward to that. The husband's the head of the wife, who represents Christ in the church. The wife submits to her husband's church submits to Christ. And so even the the issue of physical intimacy and the enjoyment and the ecstasy and, and the, 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 the fulfillment, the joy there is, is a picture of Christ's relationship to his church, the way he delights in his bride and the way that he will delight in his bride and the way that the bride will delight in him when he returns and brings the bride to himself is a picture and a looking forward to that, which is probably one of the main reasons why we need to tell people sex outside of marriage is sinful because it's taken away from the glory of God and the glory of Christ. But there's pleasure in that between a husband and a wife in Proverbs 8, uh, 5, 18 through 19 um, of a spouse satisfying the other person, delighting in them uh, like a loving hind and a graceful doe sort of idea. Um, having your your thirst quenched there and being satisfied within the bounds of marriage. First um, Corinthians seven five says that uh, says this: Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together to come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self control. But I say this as a concession, not as a command. <laughs> he's not commanding the couples to do that, but he's saying, stop to prod each other. Look, don't be intimate for a while so that you can pray. <laughs> okay. Um, otherwise, he says, come back together. Uh, so people ask, well, wh how, how, you know, what's the frequency? How many times should a couple be intimate? Uh, there's no biblical command um for that but we do know based off this verse and others like in proverbs 5 and other places the song of solomon song of solomon by the way is about uh, marriage and intimacy and marriage not about christ and the church it's not about that sorry puritans that's one thing you got wrong um and the reformers <clears throat> but it's about intimacy between husband and wife in fact hebrew men were not allowed to read song of solomon until they reach a certain age. Like, nope, you, know, you can't read that. It's forbidden. Um, read it later when you're old enough. <laughs> um, that was just tradition that they did. Um, we should be regular and continuous. Again, special guidelines for considering not doing that. Again, mutual agreement, a period of time uh, for a specific reason. Some will add fasting and prayer in there. And you come back 
uh, together. Obviously, you know, physical issues, certain things are gonna are gonna uh, determine whether or not uh, couples can be intimate. The frequency of that, um, you know, after after giving birth, <laughs> there's obviously a season where that's not going to take place, and get other physical issues, surgeries, and other things, or prayer. We're going to pray rather than being intimate right now. We're going to spend that time and pray. Why? Because there's a something big is happening right now. Something critical is taking place. And rather than us blessing each other, we're going to pray. I think couples should probably do that more often in the sense of prioritizing prayer. Um, again, frequency, Martin Luther, people would ask him, Martin Luther, how many times should a couple have sex? He's like, eh, at least twice a week. That was the counsel he gave Dr. Street. I think if you ask Dr. Street, I think he might even say like pretty much every night, unless like something else is happening and like, and like you're sick or something. <laughs> All, right. All right, Dr. Street. He said that at one of our conferences. <clears throat> um, I didn't really challenge him on that, but I was, that was pretty funny. Um, but the idea of frequency is enough to satisfy the other person. So in, in counseling, I'll, I'll ask, uh, you know, okay, you remarked on here, sex is a problem. You have an issue with intimacy. Well, how often, like, are you satisfying? Are, are you satisfied? Or are you satisfied? And so you want to ask that, like, how often is enough enough to satisfy the other person? Because it's not about you. It's about you giving of yourself to the other person. <clears throat> it should be enough to avoid temptation because of a lack of self-control, then it should be enough to be considerate of the other person, Philippians 2. So you're not demanding sex, you're not demanding and forcing that or requiring that uh, because you're being considered of the other person. Again, again, because it's not about you. Any limitations on sexual activity within marriage? It, it cannot be sinful, uh, selfish love. It has to be unselfish love as a motive for uh, intimacy. <clears throat> you can't require your spouse or cause your spouse to violate their own conscience as far as different. Um, different things within intimacy and then there needs to be self-control in between um being intimate so no self-gratification or self-fulfillment or in modern terms masturbation that's not allowed in in um uh facebook I forgot the name there's uh these facebook groups like there's this uh, one called like uh the master's mamas our masters seminary wives or something like that my sister was part of part of one for a while um and somebody posted something about is it wrong for me and my husband to have like you know video or, you know whatever looking at each other on video when he's gone on business trips and he pleases himself and then she was like no that's sinful because that's about him and he's gratifying and pleasing himself and she got jumped on and was just hammered. She was texting me like, what do I say? What do I do? Um, I can't remember what I told her to do other than these verses say it's, you can't be sinful and selfish in this. But this is the, in, in churches, that is probably seen as like, totally acceptable. That's fine. Every guy does it. So let him, you know, it's fine. Um, no, that's not okay. Um, <clears throat> it, is, it is unacceptable uh, self-gratification either inside of marriage or outside of marriage because, again, the goal of sexual intimacy is not getting pleasure but giving pleasure. And so anything outside of that is sinful. You know, other kind of common questions people bring up, and we don't have to get into these too much, but oral sex is not sinful, maybe disgusting to other some people. So it depends on the couple, depends on the spouse. Or not that's something they want to to do um sodomy if you don't know what that is don't google it um but that would be something that we would press pause and say nah that's sinful that's harmful da it da it's damaging to the body it's it's not pleasurable it is sinful um it's it's outside of god's uh design so it should not be something that is brought into the marriage and then people also talk about what, what about past sexual relationships, what needs to be discussed before a couple gets married. And that's typically going to determine, be determined on who the kind of the couple is. But 
that needs to be brought up that there's um, some sexual history that should be some discretionary discussion had. Sometimes it's wise to have somebody else there to maybe help that discussion so it doesn't get out of control and the other person doesn't get too unnecessarily offended or hurt or something or just to help think through that. But there should be some discussion of that um, so that those issues not brought into the marriage can cause greater problems or greater issues. Um, a lot of details don't need to be expressed during that time. Some people might be curious, well, how many people and all this other stuff and details of who and when, none of that stuff needs to be discussed. It's the mindset behind it, the emotional baggage that may be kind of brought in, they need to be helped thinking through and whatever is what, what may need to be discussed there. Um, Birth control is an issue that needs to be discussed between a couple sometimes, um, <clears throat> or not sometimes, but it should be discussed at least uh, starting out. Um, some people hold the view that uh, there's no birth control should be allowed. That's fine. I don't see that in scripture um, necessarily. Um, I think Genesis 3.16 talks about how because of the curse of mankind, now there's death. So now there's going to be multiplication in how many kids can be born, uh, how, how the frequency uh, in which they can be born. Um, and, uh, and so now there's going to be a, a lot of children. Um, initially, this, they populate the earth. Well, the earth is pretty well populated. Um, <clears throat> so now there's some wisdom in how many kids should we bring into uh, this world? There's going to be different reasons for different people um, and the different, different ideas of birth control. They have the any birth control is permissible sort of position that um, it doesn't really matter what you do. Even uh, the abortion pills are fine because it's not yet a baby or whatever or <clears throat> certain sorts of uh, pills are fine because of that. Obviously, that, I think that, that, that position goes way too far because it, <laughs> it allows for the murder of, of a child. You also have the, on the other extreme, the no birth control position. Again, this is, uh, they would say, math, Genesis 128 says you have to have kids and you're playing God when you're trying to prevent that. I disagree, um, you know, because to be consistent with that, then they should not use pesticides um, because weeds are a result of the fall too. So they shouldn't try to control weeds. I'm not saying kids are a result of sin, but sometimes the, the frequency in which you can have kids now could be a result of that. So anyway, again, not, kids are a blessing. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Okay. Kids are, are the God that God says in, in Psalms that the person who has a lot of kids is blessed. And he's blessed. However, when somebody says, well, because of uh, we're trying to play God, we're trying to prevent this, then you also need to say we're trying to play God try, by trying to prevent weeds from growing and thistles from popping up and trying to play God when, with this sort of thing. I put it on clothes. Adam and Eve, you know, they were naked before and then they, they died or they, they got, they, they sinned and, and now they had death had to come. And so they had to be, be closed. So anyway, there's just a lot of inconsistency there. Um, I'm getting, uh, getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the position of the only non abort efficient birth control uh, pills. So there's certain birth control pills that can possibly maybe cause um, a, a fertilized egg to be expelled, um, which would be an abortion. So that's bad. Um, there are some that don't, um, but many of them do. They just don't say it. Many of those birth control pills do cause that or can cause that. So there's just some conscience issues there. Um, I would say that that's not something a believer should do uh, because of the possibility of killing a child. Um, <clears throat> um, so that's the position I would hold. Um, I, I do think Christians need to think birth, through birth control. I think there are a few that are, are permissible and that are fine. Um, some are, are not okay. <clears throat> um, so wherever a person lands, it's going to be, uh, you know, up to them. But I, I do think there's wisdom in that, that um, 
you know, somebody who has 15 kids and doesn't have a job, there's, I, I, there's a problem with that that I would have and say, is there wisdom in having another child? I don't think so. You're just trying to live off the government. That's just not, it doesn't seem very wise and very biblical and honoring to God. So don't do that. Um, at, at, for us, we've thought about having more kids. And then as soon as I do, I just, I get so exhausted just thinking about it. I can't handle this. I cannot imagine have starting a family at my age. I'm only 38. Um, but with my health problems and my wife's health problems, we just couldn't, I don't know, no way we can do this. I don't think we could. God would give us grace. But I think, so I think there's wisdom as well with health concerns and medical issues as far as having kids or not having kids, right? Um, different types of birth controls there. You can figure that stuff out on your own. <clears throat> um, letter E, the purity of marriage. Just a few things here. Purity in marriage or purity of marriage. You have a command for purity within a marriage. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 4, the marriage bed is to be held in high honor and undefiled. And let's talk about physical intimacy, their sexual intimacy. It's to be held in high honor and to be undefiled, to be pure and holy. Exodus 20, verse 14, um, among many other places, says you're not to commit adultery. So you don't bring anyone else into the marriage. Um, what I should have added in here to saw this is to, to in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, you're to be a one woman man for an elder. <clears throat> this is the idea of purity there. And that you're to be married to one person at a time. Uh, um, you're to be monogamous, not to have multiple wives, um, multiple husbands, multiple spouses. People say, well, God never forbade it for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Well, the problem is that he did. Uh, they disobeyed. Um, well, that's how God brought through, brought forth the, the 12 uh, tribes. Yeah, he did. He used their sin and wickedness, and he, he did that um, <clears throat> as part of his plan. But Genesis, Genesis 1, he sets up the basis for marriage, and then Christ in, in Matthew, 7, uh, Matthew 19 um, says that marriage is between a, one man and one woman, singular, not multiple. So God, God gave grace to those people, and they are, some of them are in the hall of faith, even though they married multiple women at the same time. <clears throat> doesn't mean it's permissible. A right. um, couple other arguments with that. We can talk about that later. Uh, again, 1 Peter 3, 7, the wife is to be pure and holy, pure and chaste. Proverbs 5, keeping away from someone else's spouse, but being satisfied with your own wife, your own spouse. So again, the, the uh, purity in marriage, not bringing other people, outside parties in. And so to do that, that involves a commitment in a couple areas, a commitment to be pure in your behavior, pure in your affections or your emotions, pure in your uh, things that, that excite you, the purity in that, pure in your thoughts. And it, it, it involves a commitment to remove behavior, thoughts, and desires that then lead to impurities. Proverbs 7, <clears throat> written to a young man. Um, Proverbs, let's turn to Proverbs 7 real quick. I didn't write the actual verse down in here. It's in a Proverbs 7. Verse 24. So now, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart go astray into her ways. Who? The strange woman i remember walking through this with owen when he was a little younger he's like what's a strange woman mean I'm like somebody who's not your wife he's like okay uh, um uh, do not wander into her paths for many are slain whom she has cast down and numerous are those killed by her their ways the ways to sheol or hell or in her house, ascending to the chambers of death. He's led away by his desires into death. <clears throat> the patterns of immorality can lead to um, things like fornication, adultery, immorality of any kind. They progress. They don't just happen. Nobody wakes up one day, I'm going to commit adultery today. I'm going to have an affair today. I don't like the word affair, by the way. Affairs seem fun and exciting. 
oh that sounds fun adultery is it's, it's a biblical word um <clears throat> people like the word affair just because they don't want to be convicted as much or something i don't know you can use it and i'm not going to harp on you but actually wayne mack uses it so there you go i don't agree with wayne mack on that one point um <clears throat> uh but it has a progression again nobody wakes up i'm going to do this today no it's 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 been a progress and so um <clears throat> Here's, here's how things progressed, for, uh, especially for adultery. There's emotional readiness because you're not resolving conflict in the home. There's bitterness, there's frustration, there's anger. There becomes a growing awareness of another particular person at work or at church or somewhere, at a store that you frequent. There's time spent thinking about how the other person looks, their attractiveness, their physical appearance. There's an innocent meeting between you and this other person. And then there's time spent comparing this person to your present spouse. When Max said mate, so I left it in there because that's his words, not mine. But I, I prefer spouse. I don't know why he says mate. And then there's time spent thinking about the negative, unpleasant aspects of your current situation, or your current, current spouse how you're unhappy and unfulfilled. There's, then there's an intentional meeting, but it's engineered to look unintentional. Oh, I didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> you knew. And then there's a public lingering with this person. Oh, it's okay. We're in public. We're in the church foyer together. It's fine. Even though we're talking about intimate things and things that we shouldn't be discussing, but we're in public, so it's not a big deal. And then there's private lingering. Well, pastors do this. Well, why don't you come to my office and we'll talk about it. One of the guys at Masters, I, I know one of my professors got fired. Because he'd meet with gals, meet with college-age students and his college-age girls in his office a lot. He was confronted about it many times and wouldn't listen. Eventually, they fired him. I always thought it was weird. I always thought it was weird. Yeah, there was a door in the window. You could see what was going on. And he never did anything inappropriate. But <clears throat> it just was weird. What was weird? What was that? What was weird? What was that he was meeting as a, as a counseling <clears throat> pastor, meeting in his office with young gals by himself. Right. That's just not a good idea. So is it not even good, like, yeah, publicly to talk to? What, I mean, you know, like, like if I see Jill at church. No, yo, no, yo. Please talk to Jill at church. You know what I mean? I talk to Jill at church. We that's where we have a lot of our conversations is because we're there and well, with a bunch of I mean, people. Like a church, kind of like. Yes. That's the one. But you, but hey, like hey, I'm going to talk to another gal about things that are pretty private it's a public area where i'm just in my heart i'm like drawn to them right, right. that's a whole nother issue right um obviously yeah talk to talk to jill talk to other women at church it's fine it's a that would be awkward i'm not gonna talk to you sorry you're, you're a woman <laughs> or hey you're a man i'm not gonna talk to you my husband's not here no but it's the it's the the motivation behind it um, but what this gentleman was doing, this professor was doing, was bringing girls in his office and closing the door. Yeah. There's a window in the door, so he thought it was okay. I just don't like that. And no one else really thought that was appropriate either. And he was confronted on it, and eventually he was fired. They didn't really tell me why he was fired, but I, I, I knew the other professors. I knew what was going on, and I, it wasn't appropriate. Um, even my wife was weirded out when that happened. She's like, why? Like the other professors, Dr. Street and whatever, they'd have their secretary come and sit in oftentimes. They wouldn't do, they, that's just what they would do. Hey, you can, secretary, can, I'm going to schedule, can you schedule an appointment when I'm available and when you're available? So you can come with me or bring somebody else or whatever. That, that's, that's what, that's how they would handle that. And that's appropriate. That's what I do. I don't meet with women alone. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> um, so I have, I have Jill come with me. 
um, or somebody else come with me. But there's that private lingering. And this is where pastors can get themselves in trouble. This is where guys get, get they trap themselves and they convince themselves it's okay. Um, letter J there, time spent dwelling on how good the other person makes them feel. They make me feel great. They're sensitive. They're listening. They don't put me down. They make me feel great. They make me feel encouraged. More frequent meetings for apparent legitimate purposes are taking place. Again, if we're in a, in a church setting, well, I, I just need more counseling. I just need more help from the pastor or whatever. Whatever it could be. Um, pleasurable isolation. So you're uh, alone. Maybe you're in a public place, but you're alone together and you're enjoying it. You're both are enjoying it. There's an affectionate embrace, seemingly maybe innocent, but there's an affectionate embrace. You think nothing's wrong. You rationalize. You justify. There's passionate embracing. And then there's a sexual encounter of some kind. And then there's deviousness, deceitfulness, covert meetings to make this take place. You struggle with your conscience. You vacillate on these things. You become guilty and blame shift, though. You live a double life, keeping up appearances. Your spouse or other person may find out and you're confronted. Initially, you deny it. And eventually, you continue. Uh, but then you're forced to admit what's happening. And at that point, you decide either to continue in the, in the, in the, in the adultery, but yet remain married for the sake of the children, the present spouse. Like, who does that? Um, decide to repent, seek help, or you divorce. Think somehow that will make you happy. And these sort of things happen all the time. I have known too many men personally who have done this one of my wife's disciples her mentors at the church she went to um i met her multiple times i met her husband multiple times they gave us some marriage counsel some marriage advice um my wife knew her kids um they're similar ages um and um, a couple years after we moved up here we get a call from this gal and she just it just tells sarah what happened that her her husband um i don't know if he admitted it or confessed or just somehow he was caught that he was in another relationship for years and he was a deacon at the church um down there where my wife used to go um and he anyway he was caught he was found out um the elders confronted him. He just said, get away from me. I'm leaving. I'm leaving my wife. So the person's going to make me happy. I don't care what you say. I'm finally leaving. Uh, I'm done. And uh, within a week, he was disciplined out of the church because he just utterly refused. Refused to talk to anyone. He wouldn't say a word to anyone. He wouldn't meet with anyone. And just, well, we, have, we had no choice. We have to discipline you. And who knows where he is? Wow. So that happens to pastors a lot, right? Like that whole thing. Where you... <clears throat> that happens to pastors. Yeah. I mean, there's a very popular pastor. He's a very, he's a reformed guy. He's a guy that we would look up to and that, that I he used to preach at Shepherd's Conference. He used to preach the doctorate program at Masters. So, like, he was in two different adulterous relationships. And so, this is amazing theological question they i mean are they I mean, saved yeah i it depends so this guy art art or Zerdia, um i believe he's saved because when he was found out he repented he confessed he basically said i, I know i'm i know i'm wrong i know i deserve nothing i'm gonna leave my church obviously he has to quit he was fired from his church in the seminary position he had they fired him but they didn't discipline him because he was shown remorse he was shown repentance he was shown fruit he said in fact in order for my church to actually like deal with this i'm going to move to another church 
to another area and to another church. I'm going to find a secular job. And I'm going to get counseling from this cut from this pastor that I know really well, who I trust. We, I need a lot of care. My wife needs a lot of care. I'm going to move and separate us from the church so that you guys can shepherd the church and deal with the things that I screwed up. And one of the things that I appreciate, I, you have not heard one word from this guy in the past three years since this has taken place. Not one word. He knows I'm done. I'm, I'm disqualified from ministry forever. I have no reason to be saying anything. Right. However, there's other guys who fall into the same thing. They do the same thing. And then like a year later, they say, well, God's grace is more sufficient. God's grace is awesome. And now I have a greater ministry because I was in adultery. No, shut your mouth. Push a broom, get out of ministry, and just stop making this a big, like, stop making this all about you. Those guys, I hesitate to say, yeah, they're probably a believer. I mean, because there's no fruit of repentance. There's no remorse. There's just like, well, yeah, God's grace, though. And right. no. So, that, well, okay, so for somebody to say falls into that sin and gets. I mean, has a heart attack. Let's just say right in the middle of the act of it, right? I mean, I just yeah. say, oh, no. will they go to hell? If they're believers, no. No, no. If they're saved, but, no, so nothing can separate them from the love of God. Nothing, not even that. No, no, no. If they're saved, nothing right. can separate them from the love of God. If they are genuinely saved. And maybe God killed well, them. Good. They're going to bring, they're going to come back. To yes. They're, yeah. A, be, a right. true believer will repent. Right. Or, as we see, some, some believers in the New Testament were taking to, um, in, in Corinth were taking communion unworthily, and God killed them. Right. Well, I mean, I, I mean, because that. Like, so it could be God, well, God I, killed this person to stop the sin, to stop yeah. condemnation upon them. I, I don't know. No, I, yeah, I just, I guess. The whole idea with like, Ravi Zacharias. Right. The, we, he has no, I mean, we have no assurance of his salvation. We have right. zero. Was he saved? I, I don't know. But with, if he was alive, what would I say? I would say, you're not saved. Right. Based off your lifestyle, there's no way you're a believer. This is impossible. You've been living in hidden sin for, for decades? No. A right. believer doesn't do that. Well, I mean, so like adulterers and fornicators. That's why it says adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals, murderers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Right. Because you are doing that without repenting. Right. I and mean, a believer, like, a believer is not in her, a believer is not going to be in a habitual sin like that, right. like habitual adultery, habitual yeah. lying. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like in my own, like so I got when I got saved three years ago, like I, I, I fell back to drugs, but it was like, a, oh my sure. gosh! But you're not in a habitual state of doing that. Yeah, quite. I it used to be, and they had I, the only way I stopped was handcuffs great I mean, that's that why we have cool. the state that's why we have the law right to right. help with that yeah so that you can get saved <laughs> yeah, so. yeah yeah no yeah man it, it, this this issue is just it's just it's such a difficult one because it's so common unfortunately so i was talking to a pastor uh, not a pastor talking to a guy today he visited our church yesterday him and his, his family did you meet them they were from montana northern montana yeah. Yeah, and they had a couple of other kids, and they were down for a ski race or whatever. Um, I talked to him today for like an hour. He's just like, we're going through a tough time in our church, and he's like, tell me about your church. And he just asked so many questions. I kind of thought, are you? Are they, they want to like move here because they're, they're checking out our church? Like they asked me so many questions. I just was so thankful for. It. But he just said our past two pastors were in like adultery and like pornography, and like, what do we do? It's like our, our men don't want to do anything. Our men just don't, are apathetic. I was like, well, get a new pastor from like expositors or masters, call these two places and you're the guy. Right now, you're the guy. Show them purity. Show them faithfulness. Show them how to shepherd their family. Like you don't need formal training. Just you're the guy. But it was just discouraging. It was just sad to hear He's like, our past, our, our previous two pastors were in like adultery or pornography. Again, another pastor, one of, our, one of the elders, the chairman of the elder board of the church that sent me out here, 
He was in adultery for over a decade. Unbeliever. He was the chairman of the elder board at one of the godliest churches I've ever known. He was an unbeliever. Thankfully, he was caught. It, it came out. He was confronted. He admitted it. He got counseling, biblical counseling. He got saved and is still at the, at the church. Do you know other people know that they're not believers? I don't know. I think they're so deceived, they just don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But thankfully, he got saved, and his wife came up to me one time and said, Matt, did you hear what happened to my husband? I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I heard, like, I didn't know, I didn't know any updates. And she's like, he got saved. He's a new person. Like, I have like a brand new marriage. It's incredible. I was like, oh, praise the Lord. Because he, he like discipled me a little bit. And that we were over in their home. I, I discipled their kids. He gave me some great marriage advice. And all the while, he was in adultery. And he caused a church split. But the Lord redeemed it. He saved him. So we were saved before then. No, totally yeah. unbeliever, which makes sense. The decisions he was making on the other board and people followed him, which was discouraging. But I mean, they didn't know. They were they're the prof a professor at Masters. He, he left his email open. His son, who was another professor, came up and saw his dad's email and saw a note from this other gal. Ooh, everything went. This happens to the best of men. Not the best of men, I guess. This happens to this happen. This happens to people in both reformed circles, charismatic circles, goofy circles, whatever, wherever. And so this is why I ask for you guys to pray for me and Eric, Colby, Neil, Brian, yourselves, everyone, Richard, uh, Todd, Seth, the leaders, especially, that we would not give in to this. Pray for yourself so that you won't give into this. <clears throat> it happens all too frequently. But it doesn't happen all of a sudden. It's slow, which is why um, our elders and our elders in training um, pretty much, maybe not every week, but a couple times a month, ask each other pointed questions. Are you in any sort of sexual sin? And we could lie to each other, um, but we ask each other that. Are you in any compromising sins? And I ask people that all the time. Are you looking at anything inappropriate? And I, I'll ask some guys, are you lying to me? <laughs> are you lying to me right now? And some guys will say, actually, yeah, I'm, I lied. All right, man, just repent. And let's walk through this. Why would you lie to me about this? Don't lie. Just let's just love the Lord. Let's just love Christ. And uh, if you're not married, then look forward to that. If you are married, love your wife. Love your wife or love your husband or whatever. So, um, yeah, any questions? Any other questions or thoughts? My computer is about to die. Yeah, well, I have 11 minutes, so. <clears throat> as far as the, the last 20 hours. Yeah, any other questions? As far as the birth control thing, what verses do you have to go along with that? The, the um, first, it was like the first one where you were like Genesis 1, 28 or something like that. But then it was like, I've just well, never. Genesis, that I thing, say the, Genesis 3, 16, the curse upon Eve. would be probably a big one. Um, um, I've never heard that analogy about the weeds. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, what was that? What's the matter of getting, getting rid of weeds? Because weeds are bad. Mm -hmm. You can't grow a, a healthy garden with weeds. Um, other, other passages I would go to would just be probably more wisdom principle passages and Proverbs um, as well. Um, as far as thinking through um, how to how to make good biblical decisions, um, again, I think if a, if there's a couple who 
you know, I, I don't want to tell a couple because you, because you don't have like money, you shouldn't have kids. I'm not saying that at all, but is there wisdom in, Hey, you don't really have a job or you, you work at McDonald's, but you have like 10 kids. Is there wisdom in trying to get pregnant again? That doesn't seem wise and, and kind of looking at bigger picture kind of wisdom principles. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I would probably approach that um, depending on the person. Um, some people would say too, you know, I don't want to have kids. And so I would, I would want to press them on that as well. Um, like why is, is it selfish? Is it not? You know, Paul says in, uh, in first Corinthians that maybe it's wise not to have kids at a certain time because of persecution, because of suffering, you don't want to bring that into the world. So there could be reasons for that as well. Yeah. Good question. Speaking of kids. We have uh, just a few minutes here, maybe five, eight minutes before the computer dies. Um, <laughs> your, your cat. Um, let's see here. Uh, the goal of parenting. So we're, we're the next three sections are on parenting. We'll cover just a few minutes of tonight and we'll finish it all next week. Some of them, the last, um, the last section is pretty, pretty quick. Um, parenting. I have so much experience in this. I am perfect. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I remember, I remember seeing some of these kids at church when I was uh, engaged or newly married thinking, man, my kids will never do that. And now I think, I wish my kids did that. Um, I remember judging parents, it was sinful, but then I've had people come up to me, maybe I told you this before and don't ever do this, but I've had people come up to me and say, Hey Matt, I just want to let you know, like, um, I used to judge you as a parent. I used to think you were a bad parent, um, because of the way like your kids respond and like act. And this was like when they were three and four, um, or so, it's like, but now I have my own kids and I just realized how hard it is and how difficult it is and how they sin. And I was like, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah, please, please forgive me for judging you. I was like, you know, and I said this to them because it was a good friend of mine. I was like, don't ever say it to anyone ever again. Like, thank you. I love you. I don't take offense to that. I don't care. Thank you. You shouldn't judge me, but don't say that to anyone. Like that's unnecessary. It's kind of going up to a, a person. Hey, I, I, please forgive me for lusting after you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's inappropriate. You, you don't want to do that. That's, uh, but anyway, that we can, we can, we can judge other parents pretty quickly. Um, sometimes unnecessarily. So, um, uh, um, because parenting is difficult, especially parenting now in the 21st century, I think presents a new set of challenges, uh, compared to when, uh, when just when I was growing up um there but god gives a lot of grace to parents god gives a lot of grace there are clear biblical principles that must be lived out but there's different ways to apply that different ways to apply these biblical um principles um and so we have to be careful again not to judge other parents for what they are doing or not doing however if they're in sin or they're not obeying biblical commands like spanking um or disciplining their kids or telling their kids no, then we should correct that as patiently and gently as we can. Um, but we shouldn't judge people for, hey, you don't homeschool or you homeschool or you let your kids wear uh, makeup or you let your kids get their ears pierced or you let your kids go hunting or you let your kids do this or you let your kids do that. Your kids watch that show. Your kids read that book. We gotta be careful. Uh, I think I said one time in a sermon about parenting. Uh, about like it's okay to let your kids read Harry Potter, and I uh, saw some like. <gasps> um, I realized later I probably should have said that because I was I did it for the shock factor and I was just I was stupid. Um, but you know the judge parents for letting their kids do that. Now again, there's certain shows that you shouldn't watch because of. Um, basically, there's so many shows on TV right now like a rated TV MA. And I'm assuming it's because of 
sex. And so it's basically you're watching pornography in these TV shows. Don't let your kids watch those sort of shows, right? Adults shouldn't be watching those sort of shows. I think Keith Lambert, because uh, Game of Thrones, I've never seen it, but I've heard that there's a lot of inappropriate things in there. Uh, and a lot of Christians were trying to blog about how, how it was okay to watch it. <laughs> Heath Lambert just went after him. He's like, if you watch Game of Thrones and you're okay with the nudity, are you a believer? <laughs> he didn't, no one really liked him for that. But I was like, that's really helpful. That's really good. Anyway, um, again, parents, we can tend to be legalist because we're placing our judgments upon other parents for what they are doing or not doing. Um, again, hundreds of different theories, ideas, books, whatever. Uh, and we need to think in terms biblically as far as parenting goes and not just pop psychology. There's a few minutes here. Um, so what are some goals for, for biblical parenting? A couple of um, unbiblical goals would be saved children. <gasps> what? What do you mean? What I mean by that is that when my goal becomes my children must be saved, then I make that the idol. I make that my goal. I make that the thing that I am basing everything else around, forgetting the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one who saves and regenerates children. I really want little Johnny to say the sinner's prayer. And so I'm going to kind of manipulate and force him to do so. And then I'm never going to doubt he's not a believer, even though he strays and goes off on his own, because if you raise a child, the tra 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 child, we should go, he'll never depart from it. They cling to false promises. Now, should you want your kids to be saved? Absolutely. Should you try hard to lead them to the gospel? Absolutely. Every single day. That needs to be what we are doing. But if I make my mission in life, my goal, if this is how it has to be and my success is built upon this, I think I've missed something. I know a few godly men, godly pastors, who, whose kids are unregenerate. And these are godly men who are qualified men. <clears throat> and plus the scripture says that the Holy Spirit regenerates, not parents. But parents are to do what? Raise their children in the fear and discipline of the Lord. That's their job. And they entrust the results up to the Lord. Um, social skills. So yeah, I want my kids to be in social activities because I want them to have friends and, and be in Boy Scouts or Scouts now or do piano and dance for the purpose of developing the skills or sports or do this so you can be the best or whatever. I want my kids to be in the sports. Well, that means we can't go to church. Oh, yeah, well, you know, it's uh, almost time for church, but uh, the game's not over, so we're not going to make it. I, I know, you know, many pastors, who, the kids were like, Dad, why can't I play soccer? Well, because it, they required it to do it on Sunday, and we just, just can't do that. We, we, can't, we can't miss Sunday. Um, sometimes, uh, like Eric did this, Eric, you know, Charlotte was doing soccer, and they let him do it, even though Charlotte missed a few Sunday games, and they were at like some like conference, or whatever. Um, and they were a lot of the parents were really upset that Eric took Charlotte home a day early because well, it's Saturday and we have to be at church tomorrow. I'm a pastor. I, I preach. I go, can't you get someone else to do it? And why can't you just miss one week, whatever? And sure, you could, but he's shown them. He's shown his kids a priority of being at church and of, and being a part of the gathering, not just we're going to be here for social skills, or you're going to you know teach your kids how to set a table and set a plate and set a placemat, or whatever, but not teach them how to honor the Lord. And get well-behaved kids, you know, good manners. I want my kids to obey really well in public so that I feel like I'm a good parent. Again, that's great. You want your kids to do that, but it's, I want my kids to learn how to clean up after themselves and, and, and say yes and say thank you and say please and to, to, uh, to pick up after themselves because I want them to learn to serve others and to prefer honor others and to honor God, not just because I want them to be well-behaved children or because I want my life to be easier. I want them to be thinking above themselves and loving their neighbor and loving others more important than themselves. And that means taking your plate to the sink, picking up your dirty socks, throwing things in the trash rather than on the floor. We are still working on that in our home. <clears throat> it's for the purpose of their motivation behind it, right? Or, hey, I want good education. Uh, great. 
have your kids well educated. We homeschool because we want our kids to have a good education. But if that's my goal, then all I worry about is them getting a good job, getting a good education, education, so they can get a good job and they can do this and they can do that. Like, and it's often to 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 the, the the neglect of godliness. I'm pursuing their education, but I'm not teaching them how to love God and how to study and read the Bible. My friend called it the myth of scholarship. If I just get my kids to have a good scholarship to get into college, then I will have done my job as a parent. He's been a youth pastor for a long time. He just coined that term. And I really, I really like it. But then maybe they don't shepherd their kids because they're pushing them to get good grades or whatever. Again, they're manipulating to get their kids to have good grades and so on. Um, those are just some unbiblical, I think, sort of goals we can get caught up and trapped in. Again, our... Every single one of those things, are, it can be helpful and can be appropriate and can be things that we should try to pursue, but not as the main goal in our parenting. The goal in our parenting, as we'll see, um, as we'll finish up next week, is the glory of God. The goal of our parenting is to glorify God. To raise our kids in a way that is pleasing to him. It honors him, and we trust in him for the results. That's our, that's our goal as parents. So with that, we'll end it, and we'll pick up at that point next week, um, <clears throat> finishing. I, we'll have to go quick on some of this stuff, I guess, but we'll finish this uh, next week. Cool. All right, guys, let me pray. I'll let you guys get out of here. And Will will get out of your house. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your kindness, your goodness to us. Uh, give us grace and wisdom as we <clears throat> counsel others and help others and disciple others to think through these issues. Um, help us to apply all these truths to our own hearts. Wh whatever sphere of life you have us in, whatever avenue you have placed us in, may we first apply these principles um, to our own lives so that then we can go and be more effective as we counsel and disciple others for the glory of God and the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we ask all this in your name. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Matt.